Before we get started, I want to tell you about something new that we're trying. All podcasters know the best way to grow your show is through word of mouth. So we created a referral link that makes it easy to share the podcast by text, email, or DM to your friends, family, or anyone else you know who could use a little dose of inspiration for civic engagement and our collective future. It's a two-step process. First, follow the link in our show notes to get your personal referral link, which you can then send around. Once you share our show with five friends who then download the podcast, I'll send you a handwritten thank you note and a future hindsight button to thank you for your support. If you share it with 10 friends who download an episode, I'll send you a branded Future Hindsight Moleskin Notebook. Yep, a real Moleskin Notebook with our logo on it. Thank you for spreading the word and thank you for listening. Welcome to Future Hindsight. I'm your host, Mila Atmos. Each week, I speak with citizen changemakers who spark civic engagement in our society. Our guest today is Zephyr Teachout. She's an attorney, political activist, antitrust and corruption expert, and law professor at Fordham University. A rising star on the left, her campaign for New York Attorney General in 2018 was endorsed by Bernie Sanders and The New York Times, among others. Her latest book is Break Em Up, Recovering Our Freedom from Big Ag, Big Tech, and Big Money. She makes a clear and compelling case why monopolies are the root cause of many contemporary issues like economic inequality, climate change, and even limiting the power of average citizens. In fact, monopolies are evolving into political entities that often have more influence than the actual government. We talk about how monopolies are profoundly anti-democratic and why the United States needs to get serious about trust busting again. We used to have thousands of antitrust leagues all around the country in the late 19th century. Anti-monopoly was a core part of political activism really through the New Deal. And then in some ways, because FDR was so much a trust buster, he did it so well that it actually took some of the energy out of it. But we need to get back to not just having local environmental groups, but local antitrust groups. Let's listen in. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. So I loved your book. You make a really strong argument to break up monopolies like Facebook, Google, Amazon, in order to enable a moral market that allows for creativity, compassion, and warmth in the pursuit of the basic American dream. So before we start, I thought we would ask a very basic question. How do you define monopoly? Well, thanks for that question, because it's both basic and fraught. In fact, one of the key arguments of this growing anti-monopoly movement is that we have just been defining it wrong for 40 years. And what a monopoly is, is a company that essentially has the power to set the terms of interactions. I think sometimes people think monopoly and they hear the mono and think there has to be just one. That's not true. Uh, when Standard Oil was broken up, one of the big trust busting moments you may have heard about, it had about 65% of the market. A monopoly is a private company that has governing power. Now, for the last 40 years, courts and enforcers have come up with a pretty strange notion in the scope of American history, but they've convinced themselves of its accuracy. And that is basically the only way to think about monopoly is when a company ends up raising consumer prices. And there, you know, obviously when a company has the power to set the terms, one of the terms that it can set that's quite dangerous is consumer prices. So for instance, in the pharmaceutical world, we see drug monopolies that have the power to set terms and set really outrageous terms. But that's not the only harm here. The harm is not just about consumer prices. It's about becoming a form of private government that's sitting inside our democracy. So can you give us an example of how a private government actually works? 
I think one of my favorite ones is about arbitration. Maybe that's the clearest example. So I really want people to stop and think what government is. That's one of the goals here and how we see and understand power and private power. And one of the really more terrifying features of this growing form of private concentrated power that is coming to govern us is that it's bringing along a judicial system. The courts of the big monopolies think Visa, Amex, Amazon, Google, Monsanto, any of these, is a system called private arbitration. And what arbitration is, is something that kind of looks like courts, but is so antithetical to the best part of the American judicial tradition. In arbitration, judges are paid by the parties to a dispute. That's a direct conflict of interest. And in practice, it's the big companies that pay the arbiter or the decision maker. It's totally secret. There's no right to appeal. There's no jury. There's no rules of evidence. There's no precedent. So when you get your job at McDonald's, there's a clause there that says, if we later discriminate against you, you won't get to go to open court. You will have to bring your suit in front of this private McDonald's paid judge without the rules of evidence applying. We believe that over half of all employment contracts in the United States include an arbitration clause. So it's this real like gut punch to courts and open justice systems. Basically, it's a perversion of the law and makes away with justice. So the bad news is arbitration is in all kinds of places it shouldn't be. The good news is Congress and the Senate can get rid of this. In fact, there is a bill that's already passed Congress. It just requires a Senate and probably a Democratic Senate to push through that would make it illegal for companies to force people to use these secret anti-justice courts. That would be a huge coup. But let's talk a little bit in terms of how they impose these arbitration requirements in terms of the way that they hire people and the chickenization of the American middle class. It exemplifies clearly how you are boxed in to certain terms and you have no redress. How does chickenization work? Yeah, we are experiencing a transformation of work right now. And people often talk about it in terms of the gig economy and often think about it as technologically predetermined. You know, if you are going to have technology, then we're moving to a gig economy. But I actually use this term chickenization because I think it's really important to understand that these are not techniques of technology. These are techniques of power. These are kind of old feudal techniques, old anti-democratic techniques. The term chickenization is actually a term that the pork and beef industry use to describe what is happening to them, which is to say they're adopting this really terrifying business model. Here's the business model. A chicken farmer needs one thing, basically, which is the ability to get their chickens to a grocery store. And because of changes, really significant changes in antitrust law that happened around the 1980s, the chicken farmer no longer faces a whole suite of options of different distributors which they could go to to get their chicken to market. Instead, the industry has been totally consolidated. So there's basically three, four chicken distributors. Think Tyson, Purdue, Pilgrims. And they, they've divided up the country uh, regionally. So a chicken farmer in one area of North Carolina will have to use Tyson's to get their chickens to market. Well, Tyson's then uses this incredible power to exercise all kinds of forms of control over the chicken farmer. They look independent. They have their own chicken house. It looks like they're a small business person. But in fact, Tyson says, yeah, well, you can do whatever you want. But if you don't use our feed, we're not taking your chicken to market. If you don't use our eggs, we're not taking your chicken to market. If you don't use our 
consultants are particular specifications of how to build your chicken house, basically exercising control without taking responsibility. And so all the chicken farmers do all that. And then Tyson says, and you have to sign an arbitration contract. So if we get into a conflict later, you can't sue us in open court. And we get to collect all kinds of data from your farm and spy on you. And you can't talk to your neighbors. You also have to sign a contract that seals your lips. You can't find out how much your neighbors are getting paid and you're going to get paid different amounts every month. So the farmer is then in a position of rational paranoia. If he or she gets paid a different amount one month, is it because they spoke out against this system? And there's a lot of farmers who have reported retaliation when they have spoken up against their distributors. Is it because of the weather? Is it because they're subject to an experiment? Maybe Tyson is giving 50 farmers one kind of seed and another 200 farmers another kind, and suddenly their profits are plummeting. They're making poverty wages. I spoke to chicken farmers, and one of the things that really comes through is the level of depression and almost debilitating rage that farmers feel when you are subject to this arbitrary power, but can't see through it. In fact, the suicide rates are very high. So that's the story of what's happening in chicken farming. But you may have already heard the echoes in here. That's the story of what's happening to Uber drivers. Uber drivers also look independent, but they are paid different amounts, experimented on required to sign arbitration clauses in this black box. There's also very high levels of depression. Something that is very front of mind right now is the way in which restaurants who are facing just a devastating pandemic related crises also have the same relationship to delivery apps. Just as a chicken farmer needs Tyson to get to market, a restaurant requires Grubhub, Seamless, the delivery apps to stay alive. If 10, 15 percent and now as much as 50 percent of restaurant revenues depend on delivery, you can't survive if one of these platforms kicks you off. And the platforms have the capacity to charge enormous rates, extract data. So it's not just gig work. This is a feudal form of government that is spreading across all these different industries. I first want to depress you, but second want to empower you. Because the good news is, once you see this not as a technological feat, but as an old monopoly business model that keeps rearing its head every 30 or 40 years, you actually can feel a lot more power over it because we can ban these kinds of structures. Uh, and we have in the past. Yeah, actually, I think that's really the number one takeaway is that this is just an old model dressed up with, quote unquote, new technology that enables the monopolists to take advantage of workers like they always have, or that is their propensity yes. to do. <laughs> yes. Maybe a good question here is to talk about how we arrived here, because like you said, the antitrust movement used to be really healthy and very ambitious. And then in the 80s, it stopped. What happened then? Yeah, it was a real transformational moment. Reagan came in with an agenda that was very much about race. It was also very much about deregulation. And at the heart of that deregulatory agenda was antitrust. This wasn't some side issue. The agenda was do something about these terrible civil rights laws and gut antitrust. And actually, on the flip side, you'd see senators like Senator Phil Hart, one of the key architects of the Voting Rights Act of 65, who had two passions, antitrust and civil rights. And he saw them as deeply connected. So Reagan and Reagan's team also saw them as deeply connected and came in not just with a deregulatory agenda, but with an anti-antitrust agenda, appointed hundreds of judges, put in regulators who didn't believe in the regulation. That's very familiar right now with almost all of Trump's agencies. It was actually an ideological transformation. And it, it shows the power of ideas, which is both very dangerous and also, again, hopeful. Because when, when you believe in the power of ideas, you know that things can change, even if power looks pretty stuck right now. 
So the new idea that Reagan brought in is an idea that was popularized by Bork, the Supreme Court nominee who pushed the idea that antitrust laws were tools of abuse and the only real purpose of antitrust laws was to protect consumer price. The old understanding pre-1980 is that you need strong antitrust laws as a democracy protection. Before 1980, we widely understood that antitrust was important the way that campaign finance was important, that if you want to protect democracy, you need strong antitrust laws. And that's something that Bork and Reagan's team totally rejected. Now, that was a pretty terrible little era there, but you might think, okay, well, when Democrats got back in charge or Democrats in the opposition party would constantly be raising this issue and fighting to break up big companies, fighting to overturn bad court decisions. But no, instead, we actually saw Clinton, Bush, not as surprisingly, Obama, leadership in the Democratic Party, basically ignoring antitrust as a serious area of concern. This is changing right now. In the presidential primary, in the Democratic presidential primary, Warren clearly made antitrust a center of her platform. In fact, it was sort of a key moment in her rising to prominence when she talked about breaking up big tech. Bernie Sanders focused on antitrust and had an incredibly strong agenda. And Amy Klobuchar also had a powerful antitrust agenda regarding ag and news. You actually saw really only for a month or so and in a few debates but signs that candidates understood that this is something really important. By the way, people understand this. Like we've done polling and there's overwhelming support for more antitrust enforcement, for trust busting 2.0, for anti-monopoly work. People hate corporate monopolies. And it's actually one of those areas where the people are way ahead of politicians in understanding the power structures in this country. Yes, I think this is one of the things that people are not really talking about in the mainstream media that monopolists seek political power. And so the only way to address this problem with monopolies is through political action. Future Hindsight is brought to you by The Jordan Harbinger Show. If you're looking to expand your podcast repertoire, discover fascinating people, or just need advice on a specific topic, The Jordan Harbinger Show has you covered. Jordan's show was named one of Apple's best of 2018, And his goal is to make you a better informed, more critical thinker so you can get a sense of how the world works. Last week, Jordan learned about the idea of essentialism in your career, how to set proper work boundaries, which can be incredibly difficult during lockdown, and how to create a better life by saying no. Best of all, that was all in just one episode, and Jordan's show drops three times a week. He's interviewed astronauts, CIA agents, athletes, and everyone in between, so you'll never run out of things to learn. If you like Future Hindsight, I think you'll enjoy The Jordan Harbinger Show, too. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also find the show at jordanharbinger.com. You talk at length, actually, about the tools that we already have at our disposal and that we can pull back out of the drawer and sharpen and fix this problem once more, like we did in the late 19th century and especially also during the New Deal. But so what is the first thing that we should be doing? I think of it as a suite of tools, and they should all be used simultaneously. (laughs) The Biden-Harris administration has an enormous opportunity to lead here. The executive power in this area is actually really substantial, as we saw with Reagan in, in the destructive side of things. But you have both the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission as key enforcers who basically have been unbelievably passive through administration after administration. The Federal Trade Commission has the capacity to promulgate rules. In fact, antitrust laws are incredibly short. If you've heard of antitrust laws, maybe you've heard of the Sherman Act or Clayton Act, and maybe you imagine a big bound volume. It's about a paragraph. And it says, 
you can't monopolize. So it is up to the Federal Trade Commission to promulgate rules that say, okay, here are the baselines, here's some number values that we're going to attach. So when, say, two companies want to merge, when we're going to try to block a merger. One of the most important things that a Biden-Harris FTC chair can do is promulgate new rules that are like speed limits. Right now, it's as if there's effectively no speed limit on the highway, and then you put in 65 mile an hour speed limits, it would transform merger policy. This is exactly what Reagan did. When Reagan came in, his agencies promulgated new rules that said, basically anything goes, overturning the 1968 rules. If Biden-Harris come in and just put back in place those 1968 rules, totally transformational. And the way to get there is to get political energy behind it so Biden and Harris are hearing that. So agencies need to be doing their job. Congress and the states also need to step up. The judicial branch at the lower level, but also in a series of really terrible Supreme Court opinions, has dulled the edge of some of our most powerful anti-monopoly laws. These are bad law, bad history, bad interpretation cases, but they're statutory interpretation cases and Congress should just step up and say, hey, that was the wrong interpretation. Here's the right interpretation, which it does in every other area. And then what, one of the most exciting things is what's happening in states. I mean, you see, for instance, in New Jersey, they've passed a law limiting the ability of delivery apps to gouge restaurants. That's state anti-monopoly law. Here in New York, Senator Thomas and Generis have introduced legislation. They just held a hearing on it so that New York could have stronger anti-monopoly laws than the federal government. And we have incredible power here in New York. One of the things that really concerns me is that the public feels intimidated around antitrust. There's also a lot of feeling of like, well, I'm not an expert. I, I know companies have too much power, but I'm not an economist. Trust your gut here. Go to your lawmaker, call Chuck Schumer, say, I can tell you that companies have too much power and I have too little. Do something about it. And that's the level at which we can have political activities because the solutions are there. The agencies have incredible power if they feel the political pressure to use it. Congress has great ideas for laws it can pass if it feels the political pressure to use it. The thing that's been missing is the public stepping up and demanding that our elected officials protect us from this tyrannical form of power. So in addition to calling our senator, what else could I be doing as an everyday citizen to demand that we enforce antitrust laws and really break up companies like Facebook and Google? They really have a vice grip on our information, the things that we buy, but essentially on our lives in many ways. Absolutely. We used to have thousands of antitrust leagues all around the country in the late 19th century. Anti-monopoly was a core part of political activism, really through the New Deal. And then in some ways, because FDR was so much a trust buster, he did it so well that it actually took some of the energy out of it. But we need to get back to not just having local environmental groups, but local antitrust groups. Then you say, well, what do I join? How do we get from here to there where it's a part of our politics? So there's a few incredible organizations that I encourage people to follow on social media, support and engage in their actions. One is Athena. Athena is a combination of labor and small business and environmental and privacy organizations and activists who are totally committed to breaking up Amazon, proving that we can take on Amazon as New York activists did in keeping them away from billions in subsidies, proving that we can take on Amazon is really important. The Institute for Local Self-Reliance is an incredible group that is doing activity in this area. The American Economic Liberties Project, the Open Markets Institute, ACRE. These are all different groups that can use not just your support, but just engage, follow the actions they're doing because they are 
right now connecting this fight to lawmakers, creating real actions. And so some of the things that they are starting to do are marches. When's the last time that you marched to break up a big company? It's about time to start. Call your state senator. There's real activity here in New York. Call your city council member. There's actually real activity in New York City. The two things I would then say is one, I always think collective action is more powerful than individual action. So join one of these growing collectives. And then on an individual basis, anytime you encounter a lawmaker, say, what are you doing about these monopolies? Just ask that. What are you doing? And that is part of building this incipient movement that really is gaining energy. As terrifying as it is, an exciting time to get in on the ground floor on a, a new anti-monopoly moment. This is all good advice. Thank you. But I wanted to ask you a question in terms of boycotting. I think there's a deep misunderstanding of our role as citizens and that most people reflexively you know, boycott Uber or boycott using Amazon, but really we need political action. How would you explain that boycotting really is not the solution? Try boycotting Facebook as an activist. Well, maybe you can go to Instagram. You can't use Messenger. You will basically no longer be able to do your job of raising awareness around whatever issue you're focused on. Now try boycotting Amazon or Facebook as a small business owner. Facebook knows that small businesses, journalists, activists, politicians, people who want to keep in touch with their grandparents during COVID need to use this platform to keep in touch. And so it's not worried about the boycott. In monopolized economies, you actually don't have the leverage that you think you do. If there's two social media companies that wink and nod with each other and aren't about to change their business model, your leaving one doesn't make a difference. But what you can do is call Chuck Schumer, who has not been good on big tech, and say, why aren't you doing something about Facebook's business model? You have a lot more leverage there. And then finally, I think there's a lot of weird guilt that comes up around ethical consumerism, both guilt and pride, and both can be really dangerous. The guilt is that well, if I haven't boycotted Amazon, am I allowed to go to de Blasio and tell him to not give him a subsidy? Yes, you can. You know, you absolutely can. It's a false choice. And then the pride is that it turns out that people who choose not to use products for ethical reasons are actually less likely to take political action. I think that our ethical consumer boycott approach has almost led us to accept these as our overlords. It's like we've accepted Mark Zuckerberg as our sort of king of communications and privacy. And that is crazy. I don't want to be begging Mark Zuckerberg. I would never select him to be my king, even if I believed in kings. I would never want Jeff Bezos to be my emperor, even if I believed in emperors. We have to turn to the tools that actually can do something about it, as opposed to being in a supplicant position, begging Zuckerberg to be a, a nicer overlord. Yes. I totally agree. That's funny. But so what would it look like to break up one of them, Facebook or Amazon, whichever one you want to talk about? But how would it actually look to the consumer and what would it do to the business model? So let's just take Amazon because I think it's the easiest. So Amazon has a service that connects buyers and sellers and it separately owns businesses that are sellers, and it separately owns warehouses and shipping services. Those are the three key things that you probably run into as somebody buying on Amazon. There is no reason that Amazon, the connecting service, needs to also own the warehouses and shipping. And in fact, if you talk to Amazon sellers, they'll regularly tell you how Amazon basically bullies sellers into using it's shipping products because if you use it shipping products, sellers believe they are more likely to get good placements in search results. When you search for shoes, it is not sending you the quote unquote best shoes. It has an algorithm that prefers sellers that pay Amazon in other ways. So it is far, far from neutral. So Amazon 
the platform should be split up from Amazon, the warehouses. There's no reason those two should be together and it creates all kinds of different conflicts of interest. Amazon, the platform should be split up from Amazon that is also selling on the platform, selling shoes, competing with the other shoe sellers, because basically Amazon is now in a position to steal data from the companies on its platform and then compete against them. And then what's left is you'll have this platform, the seller and buyer platform, and that we should treat like we do railroads. Like you can exist and you can be private, but you basically have to be treated like a public utility. You have to have fair, open access for all, non-discrimination principles apply. Amazon shouldn't also own the advertising company that is on Amazon. So it's break up means break up by function in a lot of these cases. And then sometimes you might also want to break up horizontally. Throughout the 19th century, corporate law had these ideas embedded. The idea that you have one line of business, you shouldn't have another line of business that might create conflicts of interest. Last question. Looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? Oh my gosh. I am so hopeful about what is happening in New York State. And because New York State has been stuck for so long, looking progressive, but actually the center of a lot of inequality. And in the last two years, you have seen not just Democrats take over the state Senate, which unsurprisingly didn't reap all the rewards it should, but one of the most exciting and compelling moments for me was when new people who were newly elected, activists who went into using political power, beat big real estate in New York. It was just an extraordinary moment because you're talking about people power versus money power. The moment when in New York, we beat back Amazon. It's an incredible moment against all odds. So what we are seeing is a growing, mature group of people who have a serious desire to wield power. And I think that's really important. For decades, activists were kind of dismissive of politics as dirty. That is no longer true. And coming into positions of power and figuring out how to use that power to take on illegitimate forms of power. We are in a tough position. We are talking about taking on some of the most powerful interests in world history. There is so much progressive energy and hope and vitality that I can see the other side. Well, I hope that progressives really come through in the new administration and that we seize this moment of the pandemic time to really do what's right for humans, really, for for everybody, you know, in a way that I think we haven't thought about in a long time. It's so I mean, it's it's a heartbreaking when you look at what is happening throughout the city, the state, and the country, the amount of hunger that people are experiencing right now, the despair. When you look at the possibility that 40 to 50% of Black businesses may close during this pandemic, we are facing just a horrific economic and political time. I see Biden as not having a deep ideology, which may mean that he's just surrounded by insiders and they just do what has been done before. But it also means that if the country rises up and demands something like a new deal, except a new deal that does not have the structural racism of the last new deal, that really demands the best of what we've ever seen, that I actually think that that question mark at the heart of Biden creates opportunities for an incredible revival. Well, I hope you're right. Thank you very much for being on Future Hindsight. Thank you so much for having me. It was wonderful to talk to you. I was definitely one of those people who had no idea that monopolies were not strictly about controlling consumer prices. I'm astounded by how much power monopolies have accrued and exerted over our lives. They exacerbate and entrench unfair working conditions and inequality for everyone, and they disguise old oppressive tactics as a necessity of technology and even progress. The good news is that we already have the tools of antitrust at our disposal and that Americans can once again become ardent trust busters like we were a hundred years ago. The pandemic has laid bare just how unfair things have been and that we cannot continue as we have before. My hope 
is that the incoming administration will have the political appetite to enforce antitrust laws and protect our democracy. Next week, our guest is Vina Dubal. She's a professor at the University of California's Hastings College of the Law, whose research focuses on the intersection of law, technology, and precarious work. We talk about the gig economy and the way app-based companies have proliferated unprotected work, as well as the role of unionization, regulation, and the law to secure stable livelihoods. Precarity is a term that's really proliferated over the last 10 to 15 years. And what it signifies is work that in stark comparison to sort of what we saw in the post-World War II era in most and many Western countries, including the United States, where you had people who had one job, full-time employment, making enough money to put food on the table, to pay for their rent. They had stability and security in their lives. Precarious work in contrast to that is the rise of of work that is unstable, unpredictable. Until next time, stay engaged. I'm Mila Atmos. Thank you for continuing to listen to Future Hindsight. Our executive producer is Mila Atmos. The audio producer is Peter Fedak. And our associate producers are Miriam Zumbul and Brooke Sayan. Be sure to listen to us on Apple Podcasts, futurehindsight.com, or wherever you enjoy podcasts every week. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group.